This is a brain in a dish, kind of. It sucks at Pong, but it learned how to play. In some ways, it learns better than AI. Its creators say it's sentient. What does that mean? And why are they teaching brain cells to play video games? For some little brains, life begins at circumcision. Baby foreskin cells are frozen in liquid nitrogen and sold on the internet to a lab that infects them with a virus that turns them into stem cells. Feed them the right brain food and they can grow into mature cortical neurons in a couple weeks, talking to each other with electrochemical signals. Does it look sentient yet? The last big claim about sentience came from a Google engineer, but it wasn't based on any scientific theory. It was a religious claim from a mystic priest of a self-proclaimed cult. This time, the claim is published in a top neuroscience journal based on a prominent theory of brain function and co-authored by one of the most influential neuroscientists ever. Which doesn't mean it's true, but is it? Sentient has two main meanings, being responsive to or being conscious of sense impressions. So it has to get sensory input and then either respond to it or be conscious of it. The creators of Dishbrain focus on the responding part, which is easier to define. But they don't just mean moving the Pong paddle. You could program a computer to do that perfectly based on simple rules without any learning at all. Dishbrain doesn't blindly follow orders. It controls its own behavior, sort of like you do. The idea they were testing in the study is that brains are self-organizing, sense-making machines. If neurons are getting sensory input from their environment, they'll spontaneously try to figure out what's causing it, and if they have a way to act on their environment, they'll try to get some control over it, like a baby learning how to use a fork. You get sensory input in the form of light waves and sound waves, and you transduce them into electrical impulses to build mental maps of the world around you. Then you send motor signals, also in the form of electrical impulses, to move around that world. Dishbrain gets information about the Pong world directly in the form of electrical stimulation from eight electrodes in this sensory part of the brain plate. It can move the paddle by activating these neurons, whose activity is picked up by electrodes in these motor areas. One side moves it up, one side moves it down. But nobody teaches it the rules of Pong. So how does it learn? Discipline. In conditioning, a punishment is something that makes a behavior less likely in the future. What kind of electrical stimulation would be a better punishment when the little brain misses the ball? Ten quick pulses from all eight electrodes in sync? Or four seconds of random stimulation? Why would a bunch of neurons care what kind of stimulation they get? Because they're looking for patterns. If they're trying to make sense of the world, they're going to like it when sensory information is predictable. Imagine you're a tiny brain plugged into the Pong matrix. You're getting all this weird new stimulation telling you when the ball is close to the paddle. And you start to notice that when you fire these neurons at the right time and the ball hits the paddle, you get a nice little burst of stimulation. There's nothing inherently good about this little bit of stimulation, but you like that it's predictable. It's a sign that you're starting to understand the Pong world and get some control over what happens. But if you let the ball get past the paddle, you get this random stimulation you can't make sense of. If you're trying to learn about the world through active inference, moving around and seeing what happens as a result, you'll want to avoid actions with unpredictable consequences. So random stimulation was used as a punishment to reduce the undesirable behavior of missing the ball. And when they hit the ball, they got predictable stimulation as a reward. And it worked. They got better at returning the ball over a 20-minute training session. They got aced less often and had significantly longer rallies. They still weren't great. You could easily beat them. But they learned in 10 or 15 rallies what it took a digital AI 5,000 rallies to learn. Sure, a computer could simulate those 5,000 rallies way faster. But biological systems are natural problem solvers. And research like this might help us understand how they learn so efficiently. So it's a cool study. But did they really demonstrate sentience? Maybe, by one definition. But even single cells show evidence of learning and responding to their environment. What's more impressive, raptorial hunting or playing Pong slightly better than chance? A lot of people are more concerned about the other meaning of sentience, related to consciousness. Does it feel like something to be a little brain in a dish playing Pong? Does it care about stuff? Is it confused when it gets the random stimulation? Is it having an experience at all? There's a similar question about AI. We don't know if computers can become conscious, but we do know brains can. 
The most prominent theories of consciousness say that the massively interconnected way that brains process information might be the key ingredient for consciousness. In theory, you could recreate that on a computer, but we have a long way to go. Brains do it naturally. That's why some people think consciousness will emerge in these biological neural networks first, before we get there with AI. Which raises some tough ethical questions. Here's the founder of Cortical Labs who created DishBrain. I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating question, whether they are conscious or not. And, and, and it's one that, you know, I think we, we as an industry have to sort of grapple with and, and come up with, you know, ethical standards and guidelines if, if we are going to go down this path. You know, last thing we want to do is create uh, systems that can, you know, experience pain and suffering. The chief researcher at Cortical Labs says we should give these little brains the same ethical consideration we give to other organisms with a similar level of complexity. But we don't really know how to treat them either. There's an active debate about whether invertebrates are sentient, and we don't have a consistent ethical framework for invertebrate research. But scientists and governments are working on how to evaluate sentience and putting more ethical guidelines in place. Questions about sentience and consciousness aren't just for stoners and philosophers anymore. They're becoming urgent, practical questions. Here's the thing, it's like there are millions of cells out there in dishes at the moment that are being used for like drug experiments, right? Mm. And so what does it mean for, for, for these cells? You know, maybe they, maybe mm. they are better off if you put them into a game world. Another team taught brains how to drive little cars, and researchers at UC San Diego are going to put human and Neanderthal neurons into crab-walking robots and race them. Cortical Labs is working on connecting their brains to the internet so people can program their own tasks for it. They want to combine the dish brains with artificial intelligence and make cyborgs that live in the cloud. You have these layers and you lay them so you can actually keep stacking them. So you could grow a brain the size of a room. This thing could be in your garage, and you could have your neurons in them. I just hope the little brains are having a good time, if they're having any time at all. There was another recent study looking at human brain tissue transplanted into a mouse. I'll show you just how human those brain cells started to look. I've got another video coming up on psychedelic therapy and its upcoming FDA approval. Subscribe for those and for more weird science stuff. Thanks for watching.